Today, we're still addicted to that. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian and New Zealand flavour. Today, I'm joined again by Joe Wilkes, who's back. Hi, Joe. Hello, Martin. How are you? Long time. Yeah, great to have you back on the channel and a lot to talk about, of course, because New Zealand is bubbling away quite nicely. The unemployment rate was pretty good the other day and uh, yep. lending is flowing out the door still and uh, everything in the garden is lovely, or is it? Well, um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think we're um, we're at an interesting juncture in the market, and um, yeah, we've we've seen we've seen lending close just off the chart since uh, last year, um, since the lockdown. Um, the Reserve Bank were uh, incredibly generous with their large scale asset program, and the most generous uh, Reserve Bank in the world, and, and promised 30 percent of GDP pretty much to go and boost and shore up the economy. Um, and what that's done is it has had a, a major impact on asset price inflation and we've seen it in the numbers uh, we've got uh, house prices that have just gone off the chart um, absolutely phenomenal and so, of course yeah. the, and of course the government and the, and the reserve bank in new zealand are beginning to sort of have to turn the dial back to try and control some of this of course the question is will they do it successfully and there's a speculation i was reading the the latest uh, forward rates uh, the expectation is they might even have to lift the interest rates for the cash rate uh, in august although that may, may, may or may not happen yeah, well, New Zealanders are addicted to, to mortgage borrowing, um, and, and it's every every stage of life. Housing is the one thing that has performed consistently for forty years. Um, there's always this, you know, house prices double every ten years, and they have done since the, the early eighties. Um, people have conveniently forgotten the the thirty eight percent correction in real terms that occurred between nineteen seventy five and nineteen eighty. Um, but yeah, so the, the, the you know you you go and reduce rates to. Uh, lower than they've ever been in New Zealand's history, and uh, I suppose it's a bit like um, giving the, the keys the keys to the sweet shop to a kindergarten class. And we're you know, just going rampant for it. So, yeah, no, we've done, we've we've gone uh, quite um, phenomenal in, in terms of the, the new debt levels being written and um, the, the, the size of mortgages. Um, the, the big requests from the government, or sorry, from the Reserve Bank, to be able to introduce debt to income measures. They're allowed to review it, but they haven't been told that they can implement it. Um, and I think that, the, that everybody knows that the minute the rules change, um, we, we, you know, we're, we're going to have a, a housing housing challenge. So yeah, it's one of the reasons that I've I've recently set up a business um, called YouSell, um, and we're we're looking at uh, providing an interface between private companies, sorry, between private sellers and um, uh, and the buying public. Because we feel that um, one, I've always felt real estate agent fees are too high. There's a lot of waste. Um, there's a lot of um, agents duplicating costs of spending and advertising and office space and everything else. Um, and all of those costs ultimately get borne out by, by the consumer. We've got some of the highest real estate fees in the world. Um, and there hasn't really been anything that's challenged it. Um, I did spend 12 months as a general manager of a, of a challenger brand over here. Um, but still, even in that business, I was just amazed at, at the waste um, and, and the costs of fees. So we're, we're now out there offering a, a £3,000 $3, plus GST fee for people who, um, if they want to sell their houses and they're confident enough to open their front door, we provide all the marketing for them, all the copy, photography, advertising, um, all the social advertising, as well as the trade me advertising. Um, and then... Essentially, they conduct their open homes and we do the follow up for them. Um, so we phone, phone the buyers that have visited, they, they lock them. Um, it saves us an enormous, enormous amount of petrol costs, which we can pass on to the consumer. Um, we don't have any um, office costs, so that's great. Our call centre runs remotely. Um, and yeah, we've, we launched in April and it's, it's good fun. But I think, I think that when we do see things slow down, there are going to be people, particularly the late entrance into this market, who are going to, um, they're going to need to preserve as much of their equity as they can if life means that they have to move on again. Um, and paying three or four percent real estate fees is going to damage that, that ability to move again. Absolutely. Well, congratulations on the disruptive play. I'll be interesting to see how that uh, goes out. Well, you need to come here and do it in Australia too, because uh, the fees that people pay here are ridiculous for the service they don't get. But that's another whole story. Yeah. Why, yeah. It's always, it's always, I think it's always been a bit, a bit of a bugbear for me. It's coming out from the UK where average fees are around 1% plus VAT and coming here where they were 3 or 4%. Um, I, just, I was just shocked at, at you know, what, what the consumer is, is 
accepting. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll disrupt it and see what happens. But yeah, no, I mean, I guess the purpose of today is to talk about what's going on in the market and, and some of the things that are adjusting um, out there. Um, I'd like to sort of go into the, the Reserve Bank new lending data first, if that's all right, Martin, because I think that that's the, the big thing that isn't being talked about in the press. We talk about, oh, house prices have gone up 25, 30% in some areas, um, but there isn't any real uh, understanding or reporting of, okay, what are all the contributing factors to this? Yeah, no, that's a good idea. And uh, in fact, they've started providing a little bit more granularity in some of the data, haven't they? Um, which, of course, um, really highlights some of the pains and pressure points first time buyers particularly right being cajoled into the market so let's go through the numbers yeah well i, mean, I think we'll look at the, the, the new lending flows to begin with and, and, and these are the things that you, you can't compare everything to the beginning of last year with lockdown so i've, I've gone back a couple of years and, and looking at the, the sort of the year-on-year -year changes and if you if you take the new lending stats so we were we were seeing credit growth growing annually at six percent six point two percent it dropped off in 2016-17, which is when Auckland had its slowdown. Um, but since the the, 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 the change in um, uh, the, the world, I suppose, um, we've, uh, and, and the reduction in, in the official cash rate and the mortgage mortgage flows as a result, and um, the lending, the new lending stats are off the chart. So if you look at uh, in March data, which is quite a, quite a good month to compare year on year because it's sort of in the the tail end of the summer holiday markets a couple of months after the, the December, January slowdown. March 2008, new lending stats from the Reserve Bank, there were $5.83 billion of new lending. March 2019, that dropped off a little bit to $5.769 billion. Um, and then in March um, 2020, that dropped down to $2,749 billion. So there's, there's quite a, a big change there in terms of the drop off because of that lockdown period in March. And then you go to March 2021, and, and the new lending stats were 10,487,000. <laughs> so you're looking at it, It's just, uh, I, I, and I look at it, I'm like, oh my God, well, how's this happening? But it, it, is, it is going back to you, 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 give, you give the kids, the kids to the sweet shop, and, and if there's nobody looking after them, then they will, they will go, go, and, go and gorge themselves. Um, and that's that's been pretty much the same throughout this year. So if you compare um, in March 2019, April 2019, I'm not going to go into last year's um, data, but April 2019, um, 5.42 billion. Compare that to April this year, 8.486 billion. Um, May 2019, 6.47 billion. May 2020, 8.92 billion. Um, go into June of 2019, 5.41 billion. June of 2021, 8.526 billion. So we're, we're just, you know, we're, we're, the new lending flows are off the chart. And we've gone back up to um, over over six and a bit percent um, uh, year on year growth in, 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 in capital. Sorry, in, um, in, in new lending. Now, if you if you look at where that's happening, so that's happening at the same time as there are historic levels of, of, of low listings. So low interest rates have um, saved many investors. Um, if interest rates went up, I think investors would find it quite difficult. First time buyers would find it very challenging. Um, the, um, what it's done is it's meant that people are able to sit on sit on houses. So um, cash flows have got better for buy to lets. Um, the uh, situation for, for big people with big mortgages is that the, the, you know, their month on month outgrowths have reduced. Um, and in an economy where actually, you know, we, we're seeing growth, but we have to factor in that when you make 30% of the GDP available for new, new lending large scale asset programs, that is it's actually government funded spending. So we've got everything all over the country getting, getting a revamp. Um, you can't you can't look at a school without realizing there's more classrooms going up. And um, I'd love to be in the traffic cone business because um, if I'd only got into that a little while ago, there's traffic homes everywhere, all over the country, roads being dug up and, and put back down. Um, you've got you know, guys earning a fortune to turn the stop and start signing. I think I mentioned that in the past. But, um, so yeah, no, there, there's huge, huge amounts of capital expenditure going out, out there. Uh, and there's also, in the, in the housing sector, uh, we are at record building concerns. So um, we've, we've gone from... I suppose we've got a, we've, you know, we have had a, a need to catch up with with housing supply because there wasn't a lot that happened in 2010, 11, 12 when um, New Zealand saw its, its sort of post financial crisis slowdown in, in construction. 
But we're now at rates that are, you know, over 40,000 new consents last year. It's, it's going to be um, a bigger building period than, than we saw in the, in the 1970s, which um, coincidentally peaked in 1975 before house prices fell from 75 to, to, to 1980. Um, the other thing I think that, that isn't being talked about, and I, I, I like looking at, at things like demographics, I like looking at immigration, I like looking at the sort of the background stuff of, of what's going on, geeky, geeky, boring, nerdy stuff like you. Um, we've, we've gone from having um, net migration flows of between one and one and a half percent increase in the population um, since 2013-14. Um, we've had months over the last few months where things have gone negative. There was an initial fill up, so um, March, April, May of 2020, um, we had quite a number of people return back to, to New Zealand. And um, I actually think that a lot of those are probably the, the, the you know, hospitality workers, Kiwis, who've you know, been out on their OE, um, being made redundant in those sectors and probably coming home to live with mum and dad. So it's, you know, a few household issues, I'm not sure. Um, you know, don't want, don't want, you know, kids in their early 20s coming back and living with it, can't think of anything worse. Um, so yeah, there was a, a, a boost in immigration, but largely over the last 12 months, it's been pretty flat and, and you know, we'll see a, a net migration numbers that, that in, in some instances they have been negative um, over, over the course of months, you know, five, six hundred people uh, or more leave than have arrived. And, what, what for me is interesting is if you look at migration flows in New Zealand, when the things have got tough in New Zealand historically, people have left. In the late 70s, house prices were falling, the economy wasn't performing brilliantly, high inflation. New Zealand has left to go to Australia, to go to, to wherever else, and, and the population actually fell backwards for a period. The same happened in the late 90s, so 97, 98 to sort of 2001. Um, a lot of New Zealand have left again, and they're all in Australia now. And you know, settled in twenty years on with, with families and families and kids. Um, we we have seen this happen before. And and I don't think what's being talked about is if you look at all of the people that moved into the country. So real economy not performing brilliantly. 2010, 11, 12, Kiwis left. John Key then to increase the number of people that could borrow money <laughs> and, and keep the, the banking system going. He was a clever banker, that one. Um, can I say clever banker? Yeah, I can. Um, he relaxed migration policies. We saw a huge increase in the population and 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, large numbers of people entered New Zealand from, from all, over, all over the world. Um, they, they brought uh, wonderful skills in, great communities and, um, you know, from, from the diversity perspective of New Zealand, I think it, it made it a far more appealing place to live because of that. But what I don't think has been talked about is that those people who arrived in 14, 15, 16, if you arrived in 2016 um, and you've been working here for, for five years, this year you qualify for residency and an opportunity to skip over the ditch to Australia where house prices are cheaper, where incomes are higher. So I'm I look at I look at data like this. I think, well, you know, these people have been here for a few years. They're doing okay. Many of them won't have bought houses yet. Um, some of them will be saving up and looking at a rampant housing market. Where last year, you know, the price of median price is going up twenty five percent. You're looking at okay, well, that's another five years of them save to buy my house. Or I could go to Australia, where wages are higher and where um, I now qualify. So. It's an interesting thing that I don't think is being discussed, and, and historically, it has it has happened to New Zealand that people people have left if, if things haven't haven't been rosy. Yeah, very interesting. And of course, uh, in Australia, migration is pretty much flat at the moment. Um, we had a huge unofficial quantitative easing program for years with strong migration, right? And now we've got the official quantitative easing program here and over there in New Zealand too, right? With uh, low interest rates and, and, and money printing. But the interesting question will be what happens when the borders are finally open again? And, uh, you know, the expectation I think is that we're going to see a very significant government incentive program to try and pull more people into the country, because frankly, that's the only shot they've got left in the locker. Yeah, and, and you know, people people talk about the fact that we, we don't want to. We've, we've got um, you know large parts of New Zealand society who need to be encouraged into the workforce, um, and therefore, should we be importing people when we've got quite a, you know, a reasonably high dependency ratio? 
I don't think we have a choice. So we've talked about demographics. I think we, we did that baby business time bomb post a couple of years ago. And the demographics of New Zealand and COVID worldwide has hit at a really interesting time where you know the, the peak birth year for the baby boom generation was sort of 1955. Um, and uh, in New Zealand, it actually gets bigger for the next three or four years. So we, we're from last year, we're hitting more people at retirement level. And, and that tends to reduce consumption spending. Um, it often reduces the, the, the borrowing that people take on when they haven't got the incomes or the jobs to service it. So whatever our government tell us they want to do, I don't think the reality of the situation means that they're going to be able to do anything different. Absolutely. Well, you know, I, you and I have spoken before about um, is Japan a model for the future? Because, of course, they had the, the demographic time bomb go off earlier. And it's interesting looking at house prices in Japan. They've, they've really not done the same as in many other um, you know, economies around the world in recent times. And the other interesting question I wanted to ask you was construction. There's a lot of construction going off in New Zealand, including, of course, a lot of high-rise construction and a lot of retail spaces. I don't know whether it's the same over there, but over here we've got masses and masses and masses of retail space, a lot of them quite new as well as older stuff, that's not, just not being let at the moment. And so a lot of those new products projects just don't make any economic sense um yeah i i, I think that i've probably discovered this as a complete buggers model um and i don't know if I, I don't want to offend anybody with that but it's it's a um it's a strange situation and we've got it here you, you know we talked about this we, we did a ghost town post two years ago um from Tauranga and down the high street everything was closed the shops were eight empty i think i counted 30 odd shops empty over two roads um but they are still building. We're still building more retail space. We're still building retail space next to new retail space that hasn't been hasn't been leased. Um, I've just set up a business that requires no retail space whatsoever, um, and uh, those are those are important things. So the, the world's changed, and we, you and I can have meetings like this. Um, we're we're conducting conversations with our clients via Zoom calls and via Skype calls, um, and they can be anywhere in the country, from Dunedin to to Northland. Uh, we sold houses down in Dunedin and up in Northland, and you know we'll talk to a client like this and um, set up their, their program for, for, for starting their marketing campaign and getting them getting them going. And we just don't need any retail space. And um, as we as businesses like you sell drive the the fee levels to a more sensible um, sensible offering for the consumer, um, I think that you're going to see more and more retail space close down. Um, just just in, in the UK, I remember the you know, post GFC um, time up. We saw, um, you know, four or five competitors in each town and in the real estate sector close their offices and, and, and they, they never got replaced. And, and, you know, many of those things turned back into residential housing. I, I'm always amazed at how much empty retail space there is in New Zealand um, and, and the fact that there is still no real press from the, those people who take on the retail space to really drive the rents down. Um, and who's holding it? Who's holding this stuff that... Um, is it the banks holding it? Is it the, the government holding it? Is it lots of private landlords and, and, and investment companies holding it? Um, because it, you know the, the, the vacancy rates in in, um, in commercial are are high, and uh, there's no sign of that changing with, with all the development that's going on. Well, certainly here in Australia, quite a few of them are held by large superannuation funds, uh, but they're actually um, unlisted uh, property investments, which means they don't have to revalue them. You know so frequently right so one of the theories that i have is we've got a lot of superannuation funds who are currently sitting on theoretical paper values of their um uh, investments in the uh, particularly the you know the retail area um when in fact if you mark to market based on current occupancy and rate uh, rentals you would have to take a significant hit but nobody wants to talk about that yeah, and I think I think that's the same. And in New Zealand, we've got this wonderful thing called a government valuation. So the government tell you what a building is worth, um, and therefore that's what it's worth on paper for, for the accountants at the end of the year. Um, I remember we talked about the residential um, nursing homes and, and the time of villages that are cropping up all over New Zealand, and they still and they still are, um, where you know occupancy rates are very very low. Um, they're still building these things, and they mark to market on the balance sheet at the end of the year. And all the profit that supposedly is there is basically just an increase, an increase in, in whatever they put on the paper. So, yeah, we're, we're, we're going down the same path. We've, we've created, I think, um, because the Reserve Bank, I don't, 
Have you ever heard of the expression shitting the bed? The Reserve Bank, sh- the Re- Reserve Bank crap themselves out with COVID. <coughs> Excuse me. That's my swearing, making me, making me um, as penance for my swearing. Um, yeah, the Reserve Bank crap themselves at the, the start of COVID. And um, because they threw everything at it, lowering the, the um, interest rates, the large scale asset programs, the, the removal of any loads of value restrictions for investors, um, they just created a, a frenzy. Um, and it's a frenzy that you know we we talk and, and the you know big thing in New Zealand over the last few years and the reason Labour government got in in 2017 was because we had a housing crisis. Um, that is now a housing catastrophe. Um, there are people that are uh, never going to pay off their mortgages, um, and there are others that are um, probably going to struggle for the long periods of time to ever save enough money given given costs to get a deposit to buy something. Um, how does that impact society? Uh, we don't know. We, we like to think that markets adjust to, to sense. Um, quite often there's a painful process while that adjustment takes place and, and, and there are casualties. Um, I, don't, I don't think that we're going to see a, a housing market collapse, but I don't think that we're going to see the number of transactions um, moving forward to keep the flow of funds into the private sector, the new money creation to go and keep the real economy going as well as it has done. The last three months, um, the changes in the rules for investors has seen a, a big fall off in, in, in their numbers. Um, the, the investor proportion of new lending is, is fairly significantly down during April, May and June. Um, the first time buyer proportion of lending is off the charts. Um, and um, given that that's happening, in, in markets where there, there really are, you know, I think in, uh, nationally we're at 14 year lows for the listing availability. So this money has been created on, on transaction volumes that, that, that aren't, aren't what they were 10 years ago. Um, and, it, and it means that the level of debt is, is enormous. Absolutely. And it's very interesting that the uh, story over there is very much the story over here, although you're slightly more aware you know, at the political level and also at the Reserve Bank level of house prices. It's interesting in Australia, Phil Lowe on Friday, basically in um, giving evidence, said house prices nothing to do with us. You know, we don't even think about it. We don't even do much much analysis on it because it's not our problem, right? I'm thinking, well, hang on a moment. Whose problem is it then? Get to the Reserve Bank here is definitely part of the problem. Yeah. Um, plus government policy. But, you know, no, 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 it's nothing to do with us. No, well, the Reserve Bank here has been part of the, the, the problem, but uh, it's unintended consequences. I just don't think that they, you know, I don't think anybody knows what you pull this lever and oh shit, this has happened. Um, the Human Rights Commission came out last week and said that uh, the, the, there is a, a national crisis in, in, in New Zealand because of the housing, the housing market. Um, the Reserve Bank recognising it, they want to do some stuff. And you, you, go, you can go back all the way to 2016. The Reserve Bank wanted to introduce debt to income measures to um, bank lending back then. And back then, John Key and his um, and Bill English, uh, they threw back at the Reserve Bank, no, we don't want you to do that. Why? Because politicians like to be like to be liked. Um, Jacinda Ardern has said that she doesn't want house prices to fall <laughs> um, because the electorate at the moment and those that do go out and vote are, are the ones that, um, you know, the, the ones that, sorry, the ones that, take the time to go and vote are the ones that, that, that are benefiting from it. Um, there's a lot of a lot of people now who are being marginalised. So. Absolutely. Well, we're seeing the same here as there. And uh, Joe, it's great to compare notes and to catch up. Uh, we should do this regularly from now on if you're up for it. Because, yeah, um, I'd love to, love, to, love to get back in. I, I, um, yeah, the business is set up. You sell going. I'll pro- provide some links for you if, uh, if people want to check us out. Well, the website's being rebuilt and will hopefully be relaunched next week. Um, so, yeah, it's a proper start-up. Um, and you know the support of, of the DFA community to to try and pass on some savings to, to New Zealanders and, and and help them out put put more in their pocket at the end of the transaction is, is really what we're about. Yeah, it certainly sounds like an interesting proposition. We'll put the links and things below. Great to catch up with you, and uh, I'll look forward to the next one. Take care, Martin. All the best. See you. Bye. Bye.